walking through life is just not that easy. Trouble and sorrow come in with no reason. Same old, same old in a world that's been broken. Don't you need a song? Don't you need Trans Day of Visibility on this Easter Sunday. Come newborn with opening hearts. That's the song today. We are one love and love never stops. Those are the holidays today. We share one moon, one breath, one moment and thrown open arms. Welcome. I'm the Reverend Terry Schwartz. My pronouns are she, her. 
and I'm honored to serve as your transition minister and lead you in our service today here at the Boulder Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. I'm joined today by service associate Larry LaVerdura, our Pledge Drive co-chair Wendy Highsmith. Today's music is provided by the Chamber Choir. Yes. With help from Jeremy Dion, Tracy Bush, Julie Morris, and Bruce Wyman. That's right. I like it, y'all got for the instrumentalist too. That's good, that's good. Today's tech team is Deborah Mensch, Paula Zimmerman, Zimmerman, and Kathy Partridge. Now, take a deep breath. <sighs> take a look around you. Look to your left and your right. Look up to that camera over there. That's where everyone on Zoom is. Hi, friends. Okay, look behind you. That's where your nearest exit may be. <laughs> These are your people. It's not easy being human, and it's a lot easier when we don't go it alone. As I offer our words of welcome, hold these good people you see gathered here with you, here and up there, in your heart as they hold you. You are all welcome here today in the beauty of languages, culture, skin tones, shapes and sizes, gifts, and challenges, all that make you, you. You are welcome here. In all the ways you experience and express gender, you are welcome here. In the beauty that is who you love and how you love, you are welcome here. In all the ways you make your living, in all the places you're from, you are welcome here. With all of the traditions that inform your spiritual life and history, you are welcome here. No matter how long you are away and how soon you may return, you are welcome here. And whether you came today with a body and soul that needs support, or you come with a body and soul that can offer support, you're in the right place and you are welcome here. Join us. Join us with a curious mind, a loving heart, and a willing spirit. We welcome you today. And together we acknowledge that we've gathered today with this welcome on the land of the Arapaho and many native peoples for millennia before white settlers stole it for their own. It's good to know where we are, the ground we stand on, the earth, GPS coordinates of the heart, and the wilderness of the spirit. If you're new here, we're glad you found us. We hope that you can experience the warmth and love of this congregation in person or virtually. Please come back a few times really to get to know us. It's like if you go to a new friend's house for dinner, you may not like that particular meal that night, but you're going to love it the next week. You know, sometimes you get a steak, sometimes you get fish sticks, but everyone's going to get fed, okay? <laughs> I know you're all like, what is this Easter stuff here? Oof. We're finishing up our pledge season. Hang with us for the rest of the year, too. We've got lots of opportunities during the week for social connection and spiritual deepening. And if you are on Zoom, check out the links in the chat so that you can get connected after the service. 
Zoomies, you can hang out in the Zoom room to chat and get to know each other. And after the service, I just, I just saw this for the first time today, roomies, Zoomies and roomies, too cute, stop by the welcome table to learn more about the fellowship. There's also a QR code on the back of the hymnal. After the service, join us for coffee hour in the fellowship hall or chat it up on Zoom. We are in, well, you know it's Trans Day of Visibility, you know it's Easter, but there's also something very special about this day. This is the final day of the pledge drive. And we are in the final hours, friends. We have less than 14 hours. And I mean that, because you told me you don't want a second ask. So I've got some deals to broker with you today. Everything you see, do, and experience here is made possible by the members and friends of this congregation, the people sitting next to you and on this Zoom room. We receive no money from outside ecclesiastical bodies or organizations, everyone's crew here. And we've come a long way to get to this moment. I invite our Pledge Drive co-chair, Wendy Highsmith, to tell us about some of the ground we've covered in these last few years and weeks. I don't know about you, but my bandana is sweaty. Good morning. I'm Wendy Highsmith, cousin Rhonda to our Rosie Canella, who isn't able to be here today, but she sent this message. Dearly beloved members and friends, you are an amazing and strong group of committed people. You are the <clears throat> fellowship, the loving, breathing spirit of love compassion, reason, and life. You bring justice to our, neck, to our neck of the woods and beyond. You believe in what our fellowship stands for as shown by our outstanding pledge support. Thank you to Reverend Terry, the pledge team, Nancy Claremont, and every single one of you, we can do it because we have. So just remember where this pledge drive began. It was six weeks ago. Can you believe that? February 18th with our first ever brunch. I was scared to death you weren't going to come. <laughs> I was. More than 100 of you came and sat down together face to face for the first time in a long time. And here we are. It's March 31st. It's been March Madness every step of the way. We can do it, we are doing it, ready to fund our investment in our next year because we care so deeply about our community, its heart and spirit, and our passion for justice making. For a moment, let's take a step back, just a few years, and some of you will remember and some of you hadn't found us yet. Our, our combined campaign in 2018, making room for our future. You remember? Yeah. We finished that campaign and it was a huge success. Scroll over to January 2019, we broke ground, rather the ice, right out there for our new building. Trucks kept coming in, heaped with building materials. We told our neighbors, thanks to David Burris, that there might be a little interruption out there, a little mess. Um, then, as we get started, we receive a bill from the builder, and it's a, an additional bill. It's a six-figure number. We said, wait, stop. We can't do this. How many more bills are going to come? 
We fired them. <laughs> and we began again with Milo Construction Company. Drum roll. <laughs> The building progressed on schedule. We were at the United Methodist Church for services on Sundays. The building was almost finished. March of 2020. The pandemic shutdown changes everything. We are ready to move into this building. It is done, but we cannot. The word pivot comes to mind. It was our mantra for all those years. Sunday services on the playground, Ted rolls out the piano so we can sing. 2021, we slowly began to come in these doors. Just the staff, not us. Services were still on Zoom, but in 2022, we came in with our mask and we made sure there was plenty of ventilation and it was really awkward. No hugging. We just looked at each other like this. <laughs> Finally, October 2022, we dedicated this building. So much had taken place in those last few years, our joys and our losses. But then, in 2023 was the great occupation, as I call it. We had plenty of room for us, our neighbors, our justice partners. We were seeing each other again and it felt really good. We collected guns and saved lives. We collected food and socks for those in need. Things were happening here, are happening here with gusto. Children and youth beginning to fill our school of the spirit. And I would ask you, have you taken a look at our online schedule? It is full, full, full. I mean, you better pay attention if you want some space here for a meeting because it's really tricky. Here we are, it's 2024. We're ready to keep on doing what we do so well. So much lies ahead for us. You, invi you invested in our mission then, and you have invested in our mission now. We can do it, and we are. Rosie thanks you. She's out there on Zoom. I thank you. The pledge team thanks you. Our stellar stewards thank you. Reverend Terry thanks you. Together, we are poised for what? comes next. No, your arms are going to get tired. So yes, we are ready to do what comes next. But what exactly is that? We often have very vague notions when we're asking about money because it's kind of uncomfortable. Midnight. You've got till 11.59 tonight to close this out. That's how this will be the last ask of this drive. The last one you'll hoot this year. That's the deal. Now, how we're going to measure this is we need a response from every member, household, and friend. That's a pledge, a conversation with your steward, or a waiver. We just need to get everyone accounted for. Our staff and leaders need a final pledge total it, to be able to do the jobs we elected them to, to do. They're responsible for making the budget and they need it now. Thoughts and prayers are very helpful. I am a spiritual person. I'm somewhat of a mystic, but I am also an institutionalist and a pragmatist, and this is my job that you asked me to do. Thoughts and prayers and money. Ministry requires money. 
this mortgage and payroll ain't gonna pay themselves. It's a tool with which we bring love, reason, compassion, and justice to the world. Without it, we cannot attend to the dying, educate the young down the hall, minister to one another, and serve the world. We've empowered our leaders to make a budget from which we make a fellowship, from which we make our ministries. I don't want to ask you again. And I'm also not a Baptist, so I'm not going to bar those doors and pass that plate till we're done. <laughs> we have raised 96% of our goal. Yes. That is $447,972. We need $17,028 in the next 13 and a half hours. How we get there is through engagement. The metric of our success is engagement, and we're going for 100%. We've received responses from 83% of our people. That is 162 households out of 195, and we need 33 more. If you haven't yet made your pledge, spoken with your steward, circumstances change, years can be rough, that's okay. We just want to know, okay? Ask for a waiver, that's okay. You're in the right place at the right time. So if you're here in the sanctuary, you can use the QR code, and we'll, or we'll bring you a blank pledge card during the greeting. If you're on Zoom, you'll find a link that you can click straight to. And it's going to take you to a Google form. Don't get intimidated. It's five questions. I did it yesterday. You just need your name, your phone number, your address, the amount you'll pledge, and the method by which you'll pay. You pay no money today. You give us no financial information today. And for those good folks who are not joining us for our service today, your steward will give you one final call this afternoon. Pick it up. We are who we are because of each of us, and that includes you. Our talents, our time, our treasure is how we make the work of this fellowship happen. And today, we focus on the treasure part. As we move into the greeting Zoom, friends, please say one another, hi to one another in the chat. For those of you in the sanctuary, take a few moments to greet your neighbor. Raise your hand if you need a pledge card. One is going to come your way. Let us greet each other with love. One love and a love that never stops loving nor chatting. 
If you've got a chalice at home, you can light it with us as we light our fellowship chalice. I invite you all to join me in our chalice lighting words. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action. As I ring our bowl again, come deeper into this moment. And I invite you to be here now. Beloved community, I am Larry Lavaldur, he, him pronouns, and although I am a non-theist, I wish you all a happy Easter, a Christian holiday themed on the green renewal or resurrection of life after a cold and gray winter. It is the cycle of the seasons that bring us again and again to contemplate the necessary transformations which define our individual and communal lives. The Christian narrative focuses on the death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. In the poem I'm about to present, the he pronoun, refers to Jesus. But the poem insists that the spiritual lesson to be had is not literally revival, but rather a challenge to each of us as individuals and as a community to rise again, which is the etymology of the word resurrection from the Greek, rise again, resurrection. So we rise to the task of transformation in order to bring love, reason, and compassion to today's world as Jesus did in his life of sacrifice so long ago. With apologies to the author, I will lightly annotate the poem for emphasis, and when I do, I will quote thusly. And if it were my poem, and I do wish that it was, I would add the following epigraph from Pema Chodron. Let difficulty transform you, and it will. In my experience, we just need help learning how not to run away. How not to run away. Being the Resurrection by Victoria Weinstein. The stone has got to be rolled back from the tomb. 
again and again every year. Roll up your sleeves. Trans transformation never ends. He's not coming back, you know. He's not coming back unless it is we who rise for him. We who lay hands, healing hands on the reviled and the rejected like he did on his behalf. We who rage for righteousness in his insistent voice. We who love the sinner, even knowing that the sinner is no farther off than our own heartbeat. He will not be back to join us at the table, to share God's slash life's extravagant ba banquet, God's life slash love feast, all are invited Come as you are, and so it is you and I who must feast for him, must say the grace and break the bread and pass it to the left, must dish the broiled fish or pour the wine and pass it to the right and treat each with such tenderness as though just this morning she or he made the personal effort to make it back from heaven or from hell, but certainly from death, to be by our side. Because if by some miracle, and why not a miracle? Everything since the Big Bang to me is a miracle. What if he did come back? Wouldn't he want to see us like this? Wouldn't it be a miracle to live for just one day so that if he did, by some amazing feat, come riding into town, he could take a look around and say, this is what I meant. This is it. And we, we could say, it, it, took us, it took us a long time, but we finally figured it out. Oh, let us live to make it so. You are the resurrection and the life. The poem is over. But Easter comes every year without fail. We, you, especially you, are here to rise again, to tackle the unending tasks of transformation, not only in our personal lives, but as a loving community. Namaste. May it be so. We are now going to sing together. We're gonna to sing about what it is 
that we are going to rise for? What is it that we are going to stand for? The chamber choir is going to help us. This song may be new to you, but we'll have the words up on the screens. We'll go slow. It's pretty repetitive, so hopefully by the end you'll, you will have learned it and you'll be ready to go the next time we do it. Um, please rise in body or spirit and join in singing Rise. I will rise with all my children, I will rise against my foes, I will rise with all the Each week, we remind ourselves of the abundance of our lives and this community by giving half of our plate away to those organizations that share our values. Today, the half plate benefits the Boulder County AIDS Project. They provide support, advocacy, and education to those in our community who are living with or affected by HIV. 
and serve as an outreach and an information center to prevent the further transmission of HIV. Until there is a cure, Boulder County AIDS Project works to improve the lives of people living with HIV, minimize transmission, and end stigma. They offer medical and bilingual case management, insurance assistance, financial support, pro bono professional services such as legal aid and nutritional support um, through their on-site uh, food pantry, as well as innovative prevention and outreach programs to reduce transmission of HIV. For more information, go to the Boulder County AIDS Project webpage. You can text your donation at the number on the screen, or if you are here in the fellowship today, place a donation in the offering plate as it passes. Please give generously as you are able. Deep in the night, 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 deep in the night. Deep in the night, the cry of a swallow under the stars he flew. Deep in the night, keen as pain was his call to follow over the world to you. Love in my heart is a cry forever, lost as the swallows fly, seeking for you and ever, never, still by the stars at night. Deep in the night, deep in the night, the cry of a swallow under the stars he flew. Keen as pain was his call to follow over the world to you. Deep in the love in my heart is a cry forever, lost as the swallows fly. Seeking for you and never, never, still by the stars at night. Deep in the night, 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 the cry of a swallow under the stars he flew. Deep in the night, keen as pain was his call to follow over the world to you. Deep in the night, love in my heart is a For the work of this fellowship, 
bringing love, reason, compassion, and justice to the world, and for the Boulder County AIDS Project, we dedicate this offering. Thank you. Fourteen years ago, transgender advocate Rachel Crandall established the Trans Day of Visibility to celebrate trans lives and advocating for rights. Today, we join with people around the world to counteract negativity, stigma, and oppression, and to empower transgender people to live authentically. Today, we join with people around the world to raise awareness about transgender people and celebrate their lives and contributions. Our words for meditation this morning center the voice and experience of non-binary trans poet from Mississippi, Kay Iver. Here, Iver grieves a past lover, Missy, who took his life in 2007. When Iver met Missy in high school in the late 1990s, Missy, who was assigned female at birth, knew himself to be a boy, a man. Fifteen-year-old Iver accepted this, and two decades later, Iver came into a non-binary trans identity himself. Twenty years after a devastating loss, Iver re-examines that relationship through their lived experience of two decades and a presence lens intimately exploring transness personally and sociopolitically. And so doing this morning, we make trans lives visible. Gospel for Missy during our three-day birthday season April 21st through 24th, 2019. I rise on Easter to my 37th. Here he is risen and resent his attention. Each morning I peel the linen from my face without an angel's announcement. Somewhere not far you keep jumping from a mountain once. You talked me down from the same smooth edge. Now I eat olive and fish. Stay active by hiking the foothills on weekends. I float the femur's heaviness in a heavier sea. This Missy is not survival. When I ask the villagers why survive, they look out at their boats once. You and I spoke our own gospel like mad messiahs. The neighbors kept whispering, you were not a prince. We said, that's the way of all heroes. In three days, I'll visit the valley of your bones. Tell the ankles to sprout cartilage and they will not. I'll return to the village without the miracle of new hair or tongue. Every night, the town holds a parade for Lazarus. I can hear their lutes from my bedroom. I can hear them rejoice about who gets miracles. May we work for a day when we can rejoice that all people of all genders reliably and consistently get miracles. There is more love somewhere, more hope, more peace, more joy, and let us keep on until we find it and until we make it so. Let's sing those words together, and Shirlene is going to help lead us, and there is more love somewhere. You can stay seated. And if you can get away without looking at your hymnal, let's just try that. I'm not even going to give you the number. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
is more love. was really good. We'll keep on till we find it. I'm in a warm, humid room. Lots of trees, plants, and flowers, and butterflies. Butterflies are everywhere, just flying around. My children are wandering around fascinated, busy. There are many, many people in this room. I crave quiet, cool, dry air. There is one door into the butterfly garden and one door out. I find the door out, feeling only a little guilty to have left them with the grandparents. It leads to another room with a large glass display window of preserved specimens. At least the dead critters are quiet and make no demands of me. Thank God for small mercies. So I sit there and just keep looking at them, not knowing how else to pass the time. And then one of them moves, and I realize all of these chrysalises are alive in different stages, timed cleverly by the curators in hopes that one will emerge each day. And somehow I managed to be there in that moment. And now my neck hurts from bending over so long, kind of like this, and I look around for a chair. There are none. So I continue to stand there hunched over. Sometimes waiting for a miracle is uncomfortable. And it happens. It comes out with a big fat body, dripping bug blood. It is not pretty. It is not the hungry caterpillar. It is kind of gross, really. 
it looks exhausted. I feel like I couldn't feel sorry for myself for having to bend over that long to see it. It tries to pump its wings and it can't. Not at first. But it has to. It has to move the fluid from its body to its wings to survive. And this is its most vulnerable time in nature. Because that's who it is. It has no choice, really. Its survival depends on it. It was a cozy room decorated with butterflies dedicated to the hard work of transformation. It was 250 miles away from her home, and it was there she was recovering from her gender-affirming surgery. It was a difficult post-operative recovery, normal within medical terms. But she retched for days. She could barely eat, lost 20 pounds. She was 18 and just wanted to pet her cat, Emma. She was in a chrysalis of her own doing hard, hard work of transformation. When she was a child, she dressed in jeans and shirts just like all the other boys. Her best friend was a boy, and they liked to play with cars and slash bad guys in the Legend of Zelda video game. But as she entered high school, she felt increasingly depressed. She withdrew from her friends. She withdrew from her life. She said, I, I knew the changes going on with puberty were not me. I started to really hate my life, myself. I was uncomfortable with my body, my voice, and I just felt like I was really a girl. She discovered the transgender world on the internet, and there, there was a, a flash of recognition, and somehow it clicked, and she saw herself as she was, as she could be, as she could become. It took a few months to tell her mom. She crept into her mother's room on the bed, crying. She was finally able to tell her mother what was bothering her, and her mother, Gail, she tried to comfort her, holding her hand. It's okay. It's okay. But inside, Gail was terrified. What is this going to do to my kid? What are people going to think? What are they going to think about me? Her dad, Andrew, went into what he calls a zombie trance. He found himself mourning the child he thought he knew. I couldn't help this overwhelming feeling as if my child had died. But here was my child right in front of me. She turned 16. She was seeing a therapist and started taking a testosterone blocker. She entered her junior year in high school as Kat or Catherine. Her male birth name, Caden, was now her dead name. Her parents, Gail and Andrew, weren't sure about surgery. What if this was a passing phase? And that was until they found the cutting on her forearms. Gail and Andrew became convinced that if Kat could not live fully as possible as a girl, she would not live at all. Her dad says, it became clear to me that this wasn't a passing phase or some choice or reaction. This was truly the basis of who she was. On April 7th, nine years ago, two days after Easter Sunday, Kat underwent surgery to become more of herself. And those days, those days following the surgery in that cottage with butterflies on the walls, they were exceedingly difficult. It wasn't pretty. She was exhausted. But she had to do this hard work of transformation because it is who she is 
not a choice. Her survival depended on it. And two months later, at high school graduation, she said, I have zero regrets. It's my rebirth day, she said. It's from the archive of the New York Times, Andrew Spear. There's a five-minute short film of her and her family. Go see it and subscribe to the Times. Pay for good journalism. It's my re-birthday, Kat says. Rebirthday. Spring. Easter. Easter is not spring. Spring comes whether or not we work for it, but Easter is work, and Easter is what I preach. In the book of Luke, after Jesus the rabbi, historical Jesus, don't, don't worry about what happened 2,000 years later. After Jesus the rabbi had been executed by the state, two of his disciples walked to the town of Emmaus, one is named Cleopas, and the other one isn't named. And I think it could be any of us. It could be you or you or me. And then a stranger starts walking with them, and they say to the stranger, stay with us. It's evening. It's getting dark. And in some way, somehow, it just reminds them of someone they've seen before, their teacher, that homeless rabbi, and all the writer says is this, their eyes were opened. And as soon as their eyes were opened, he's gone. Doesn't it seem to be that way? We all try to look for hope reborn, and sometimes we see it. We glimpse it for a moment before it slips out of view, before the next news roll and doom scroll, before that apparition vanishes. But while my neck is sore, I'm hunched over, looking at dead specimens. The miracle's happening. We may not always see it. And the story according to John, that's the weird gospel for all of you who follow this, in the story according to John, Mary Magdalene doesn't recognize Jesus. She was looking for a dead specimen. She mistakes him for the gardener. Cat's dad felt as if his child had died, but there was his child right in front of him. He just hadn't recognized her yet. The Gospel of the Mark of Mark is the oldest gospel, and it didn't get the editorial contributions of many writers that the other gospels received in the 300 years that followed Jesus' execution. In the original Greek, the tense changes from past to present mid-story. And I think because it started then, a long time ago, but now it's our work in the present to take an old story, open our eyes, shift tense from past to present. And in that story, this may come as a surprise, in that story, Mark's version of the story, the oldest, the closest we have to a historical record, there's no resurrection. It just ends with the women terrified at an empty tomb. Mark leaves it there, mic drop. We don't know what happened. Something happened, somebody told something because we're still talking about it. We're still wondering. Of all of the versions of this story, most of which never made the canon, Note this, it is the oldest written story about this rabbi's execution in which the author intentionally ends it without an ending. It's a choose-your-own-adventure story. And like any choose-your-own-adventure story, there are many versions, many possible endings, and some belong to creeds we don't believe in, some to the religious right, some to a tradition you may have left with good reason and some to a God you can't believe in, but they don't own that story. This story is 
bigger. It's a story without an ending, far more spacious than creed, ideology, or empire. Don't give it away. It's yours too. That's the work, you see. To see ourselves in the story, to see the story in us, myth is not what never happened. It is what is happening over and over again. And here, in this place, one season of ministry has come to an end, and another will begin. You just don't recognize it yet. In the meantime, you've got the hard work of transformation to do. You as a congregation, and each of you, and me. What's that work? Take this old, old story. Change it from an ancient story in the past tense from Aramaic to Greek to the present tense American vernacular. You can't find a miracle with your eyes shut. So take the walk to Emmaus and let your eyes be opened. And when a stranger enters those doors and walks with you, say to them, stay with us, for it's getting dark. Then, then you can make the miracle you seek. The one that is who you are, the miracle that is if you're really honest with yourself isn't a choice because your survival depends on it. And when the world is suffering and endings, if you choose the hard work of transformation of Easter, this story, your story won't end there. It will begin. He's not coming back, you know. But the question is this, will you? May it be so, and amen. Sleep.
Join with me. We extinguish this chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, nor the energy of action. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. I invite you to rise and body your spirit. Join hands as it might feel good to you or give yourself a big hug. It's the re-birthday, y'all. Love will come again. And I wonder if this, if a scraggly homeless rabbi wanders in looking very boulderish, <laughs> I wonder if he'd say this, this is what I meant. Go make it so. Amen. We have one quick final announcement. We are having a, our annual uh, canned food hunt rather than our Easter egg hunt. This benefits the Boulder County AIDS Project and it's happening right outside the Caria door, Caria? Caria. Doors right now. Go have fun hunting for cans. <laughs>